thank you very much, Barry, and uh, thank you all for coming. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be at Ohio State with a long history of uh, research in the polar regions. And I guess this is a, a three, <coughs> threefold talk this afternoon, and we're starting with the, with the history and moving into uh, more contemporary matters. But as well as talking a little bit about the history, as you can see from the title of my talk, the big question I'm asking is, is how can the history of Antarctica's heroic era help us to answer some of the, the scientific questions that we're asking at the moment in Antarctica and will hopefully shape the, shape the future. So this is a, a, a work that is no longer just getting started, but it's definitely open to ideas. So if you think about anything as I, as I go through, I'm, I'm very responsive to, to ways that we can, we can use this, this history. So it's a, it's a great thing to be lecturing in a place where you don't really need to, to put this map up. But just in case people aren't familiar with the location of the, the dry valleys, we're talking about an area um, on the, I guess, between East Antarctica and West Antarctica, close to the Transantarctic Mountains, close uh, about a 40 minute helicopter ride from the main US station at McMurdo. So in relative terms, it's uh, quite an accessible location for doing research. And over the past 100 years, it's become a center of, uh, of Antarctic research. But one of the fascinating things about it is its very short, or relatively short, <coughs> human history. So on the 18th of December, 1903, the British explorer Robert Captain, oh, Robert, uh, Captain Robert Falcon Scott and two companions had been sledging up on the East Antarctic ice sheet. And they were on their way back to McMurdo, uh, where they had their, their uh, station. And they came across this landscape. And this was completely opposite from the, the ice and the cold and the, the glaciers that they had been sledging across. And they were amazed by this, uh, amazed by this place. They uh, called it the uh, Curious Valley in uh, Scott's description of the expedition. They came down the, the Taylor Glacier, which is just about here, and walked up as far as Mummy Pond, just around, around here. So spent five or six hours just wandering up and down the, uh, the dry valleys, or the, the Taylor Valley. And then in his report of the discovery investigation, uh, Taylor, Taylor wrote that it is worthy of record that we have seen no living thing, not even a moss or a lichen. It is certainly a valley of the dead. Even the great glacier that, which once pushed through it has withered away. And this is a wonderful irony given that the, the dry valleys have now become a center of ecological, biological research. But uh, Taylor was seeing this for the first time and didn't think any, there was anything, anything there. This, of course, was part of the famous heroic era of Antarctic exploration, which culminated in the race to the South Pole in 1911-1912. Of course, uh, Norwegian Amundsen won this race. Captain Scott uh, came, came second, and he and all four of his companions perished on the way back to, the, uh, to, the, to their base, and in the consequent end up, came famous for, for doing so. And so a debate has, has raged, um, or not raged, but has been going on for a, a long time, over the scientific content of the, the heroic expedition, of the heroic era. Were these expeditions simply using science to justify adventure, or was science a fundamental part of what they were doing? And a recent book, Edward Larson's very, very good, An Empire of Ice, suggests that the science they were doing was, was very, very good science and, and made major contributions to our understanding of, of Antarctica. And I'm probably inclined to agree with, uh, with it's Larson's take. But the question I want to ask is, is somewhat different. It's how we can take this, uh, the information gathered by the heroic era, a sort of a snapshot of the environment as it was back at the early 20th century, and then think about that alongside contemporary questions and use this to, to ask about ecological research today. And the expedition that I'm going to focus on is an expedition by Griffith Taylor. He was a, a famous Australian geologist, geographer, controversialist, and uh, he spent a week in the Dry Valleys, the first week of February 1911, as part of Scott's final expedition. And those of you who are observant will notice that uh, Taylor Valley is named after Griffith Taylor. That is no coincidence. He was uh, 
not a modest man, probably is a, is a way to put it politely, and he did everything he could to make sure that Taylor Valley was, uh, was named, named after, after him. And here is a Taylor Valley, <coughs> one of the, the largest areas of this, uh, this Dry Valley region. It's uh, approximately 4,500 square kilometers, uh, the, the Dry Valley's, uh, the largest ice-free region of the, of the Antarctic continent, and therefore somewhat unlike most of the rest of, uh, of Antarctica. In terms of the ecosystem science, one of the things that is interesting about this place is that the relative simplicity of the ecology and the ecosystems makes this a, an interesting place for thinking about ecological theory and asking questions that might be more complicated in other more complex ecosystems. And so the hypothesis of our current long-term ecological research uh, site, M MCM, McMurdo LTR site, is that climate warming in the McMurdo Dry Valley ecosystem will amplify connectivity among landscape units, leading to enhanced coupling of nutrient cycles across landscapes and increased biodiversity and productivity within the ecosystem. So this is the scientific background to what I'm trying to, to think about with the history. And my question is, what can we learn from Taylor's expedition that can help us not to answer any of these questions, but at least help us to think about some of the questions that are being asked in the, the current science? And as a historian, I like to make the case that thinking about Antarctica in general and the dry valleys in particular, in much the same way as the, we have relatively simple ecosystems here, we also have a relatively simple human history. And so this area is only a little over 100 years old, very relatively few people have ever been there, and so it's, it's a, manageable, a manageable place for thinking about quite complicated interactions. And this is what I like to call the environmental history triangle. Environmental historians are trying to untangle the relationships between the material environment, human activity, and the way people think about that environment. And in Antarctica, that, that the human perceptions are principally through science. So, just flicking back, um, what I'd like to do is, for the rest of my talk, just go quickly through the human activity, give you a brief idea of what Taylor was doing in the dry valleys, say a couple of things about the science he was doing, and then spend most of my time focused on the material environment. What can we learn from Taylor and the records that he's left about what the environment was like 100 years ago, and then try and plug that in to some of the contemporary science that's going on. So this was, uh, this was called the, the Western Sledge Journey. Uh, after Scott had come back from Antarctica and reported this curious valley in his memoirs, <laughs> Ernest Shackleton sent another expedition, the Nimrod Expedition, to, to Antarctica. And Shackleton believed that he might find valuable minerals in the dry valleys. So one of uh, the, the tasks of the, the party uh, under Edgeworth David, who went down to find the South Magnetic Pole, was to call into the dry valleys on their way back to prospect for minerals. And if, if anyone has read about the, the quest for the South Magnetic Pole, it didn't go, they, they got there, but it didn't go quite according to plan, and they didn't, be, they didn't uh, come back the way they, they left. And so this, this uh, exploration of the dry valleys didn't happen except for a couple of days in which the geologist Raymond Priestley spent uh, at the very bottom of the dry valleys around New Harbor doing a little bit of work in the, in the ponds. But essentially, nobody had been there until Taylor went out on the, the western sledge journey. He was, one of the great things about studying Taylor is that he was a wonderful sketcher and observer of the natural world. There's a very good biography of Taylor and they, they comment on his abilities to observe and record what he's seeing around him. And throughout his diaries, there are these little doodles and sketches, and he was constantly thinking and constantly visualizing. So this is the, uh, the, four, the four explorers who went into the dry valleys on the sledge journey. Uh, Taylor, uh, the Australian. Uh, Charles Wright, who was a, a glaciologist. Um, Evans, who was the sort of the, the naval recruit, and he was on the, the polar party. With, uh, with Captain Scott, and then Devonham, who went on to become a, a geologist, went on to become the director of the Scott Polar Research Institute in Cambridge. And so three of the four people in the Dry Valleys went on to, to very distinguished scientific and academic 
uh, careers. In general, they got on with each other uh, very well. Um, Debenham had a few problems with, uh, with Taylor and Taylor's leadership style. I won't read this out, but uh, there's a nice bit of uh, polar gossip. And I think part of this is because Taylor was from Australia and didn't quite measure up to the gentlemanly standards that were expected of, of polar explorers in the early 20th, 20th century. And it's not just gossip, this will come back in a few, few minutes. So this is a, a, a wonderful watercolor sketch that, um, sketch map that Taylor drew, painted immediately after getting back from the, from the expedition. And you can basically, uh, the, the route he took uh, was up the, the Farrar Glacier in the pencil mark here, up around here, down what he called the, the Taylor Glacier, and into the Taylor Valley down, down here. And the expedition spent about one week going up and down the, uh, the Taylor Valley, sketching, writing about, describing the, the environment. Then they went back up the, the, the Taylor Glacier, down the Farrar, and then explored some of the, uh, the, the Kutlitz Glacier and went back around to, to McMurdo on the way back. In total, they were um, seven days in, in the area, which Evans uh, didn't tire of telling his companions was the longest ever that people had gone without hot food on an Antarctic expedition. He was constantly complaining that they, they didn't have any hot food because once they got to the end of the glacier, they had to depot the, uh, the sledge, and so they didn't have the fuel to cook the, to cook the food. So they were living on cold biscuits uh, as, uh, most, of the, most of the time. One of the more curious things that they did was to go prospecting for gold. And uh, so following along with uh, Shackleton's idea that they might find valuable minerals, and this explains that uh, they, they looked for them, didn't find them, and so simply took the, uh, the gold pan and left it on a rock. And when I talked to a couple of the New Zealanders who went back in the 1960s, they said that they'd, they'd been looking, they'd read this description, and they'd looked for the, the gold pan that uh, Taylor had left, but, uh, but didn't find it. And this is one of my favorite Antarctic what-if questions. What if gold had been found in the dry valleys in 1911, sort of a, the Yukon gold rush continuing to Antarctica? It would be a very different continent than it is, than it is today. So that, and a lot more could be said about the, what they were doing, going up and down, the relations between them and, and so on. They, they were singing a lot, they were generally quite happy. Taylor's shoes were terrible, he was complaining about blisters all the time. And so all of these things, I think, shape the way they, they see the environment and they record the environment. Similarly, when we turn to uh, scientific understanding, again, there's lots of these, these sketches and trying to make sense of the, the valleys. And every time Taylor or Debenham or Wright saw anything, they were trying to explain why it was there, how it got to be there, why were the dry valleys free of snow, all of these, all of these questions. And this is sort of the beginning of the, the history of, of science in the, in the area. He got quite a few things right, and uh, he realized that there had been multiple glaciations going through the, the dry valleys at, at different times. Uh, he uh, correctly realized that the, uh, the, the, the snow and ice were, well, the lack of snow and ice was a result of the, the transantarctic mountains and of the, uh, the winds that would blow through the, through the valleys. He was no biologist, or there was no biologist on the expedition, which un is unfortunate for thinking ecologically, looking back. This sort of made sense. If, if uh, Scott got back from the expedition and said there, there is no living thing in there, why would, you, why would you send a biologist? So we don't have any records of uh, the, the ponds or the soils or, or anything like that, which is a little bit unfortunate. But there was a major, or a, a significant shift took place and uh, for not necessarily the right reason, but uh, at the end of the Taylor Glacier is this uh, feature called Blood Falls. And uh, Taylor saw this and believed that the, the coloring of the ice was caused by little algae living in the, in the ice. It's now known that there's probably the, the iron, um, I think, in the, in the water that's, uh, that's coming through that uh, causes the, the discoloring. But Taylor realized that there was life in the, in the dry valleys. He saw 
uh, uh, algal mats in the, in the ponds and the lakes, and he thought that this was, uh, this was algae as well. So the dry valleys all of a sudden became a, a living, uh, living environment that, uh, that could be studied later on by biologists. So the main point of, of the, the talk today is to think about the actual, what was he seeing? What was the environment in the Taylor Valley like in, in 1911? And in some ways, asking this question is made more difficult by the fact that Taylor was constantly speculating and hypothesizing and trying to explain what he was seeing. You sometimes read the diaries and say, just what, what are you seeing? Just tell us what you're seeing and don't try and uh, explain it to me. And as a historian doing this, there is quite a bit of reading between the lines. How do we um, take the, what we have, which isn't always perfect, and, and understand what the environment is behind it? One very good way of, of thinking about this is through the uh, repeat photography. It's proved to be a, a very valuable uh, way of, of thinking about environmental change. And this, this immediately, uh, the repeat photography of uh, Lake Bonnie, 1911 and 2001, visually you can see the, the increase in the, the level of the, of the lake. And I'll come back and, uh, and talk about some of that. The, there are some problems with uh, the historical record. One of them, because of the, the problem with dragging or not being able to take the, the sledge, was Taylor didn't take any photographic plates with him down the dry valleys because they were too heavy to carry. Debenham took six plates with him, and so we only have six photographs further down the, the dry valleys, which again is, is frustrating. They were constantly complaining about the, the wind blowing and the weather and uh, Taylor's feet, and so all of these things shaped the way that uh, they recorded the environment, but I still think it provides a, a valuable snapshot into, uh, into what this was like. So the most obvious change, as I've mentioned already, is the, the level of the, the lakes. And there are three major lake systems in the Taylor Valley. Uh, lake Bonnie, which is at the top um, here, which you can come down to immediately off the, the glacier. Lake Hoare in the middle, and then Lake Frixel at the end. And luckily, one of the things that Taylor did was to measure, sorry, yeah, sorry, not Taylor, Scott had measured the the narrow channel between East Lobe and West Lobe Bonnie. And Scott, in 1903, measured this, the, the narrows, as he called them, to be 17 feet wide. And then this could be used by uh, basically going up the, the sides of the, the slopes and measuring the, the 75.9 meters, I think, um, later on. And you can get a sense of how much the, the lake had risen over, over time. And you can see from this 16.2 uh, meter lake level rise since, uh, since 19, 1903. And uh, again, repeat photographs give us a sort of a visualization of these, these rising lake levels. This is Scott's measurement uh, of the, the 5.2 meters uh, back in 1903. In 1911, Taylor measured, or didn't measure, but he reported seeing the narrows and said that this is 100 feet wide in, uh, in 1911. And so the plot on the graph uh, would be sort of showing a fairly dramatic rise between 1903 and 1911. And Trevor Chin, a uh, New Zealander who first began doing the, the lake level these historical calculations, he dismissed uh, uh, Taylor's 100 feet figure, saying this is, this is too rapid a rise in too short a time. And uh, again, 17 feet sounds very accurate, 100 feet is just looking at it and, and, and guessing. But uh, recent, or recent work by, uh, by Peter Doran um, in the one, this one before, what Peter did uh, was to, to send somebody out on the, on the ice with a drill, and uh, they could see these uh, features in the background, and uh, were able to drill down and confirm the. This is a Taylor photo, and confirm that the again that the the lake level rise that Taylor had uh, had measured was uh, was was accurate. So uh, we we now think that this this is a, a fairly accurate position on the 
on the chart. And then from the 19, late 19. 60s onwards, we have a, a, a very good record of, uh, of lake levels as the long-term LTER site has, uh, has come in. So this is a fairly radical change. A 16.2 meters in uh, 100 years is, uh, is, is going, going on. And Barry knows all about this story, but uh, when I first got into the, the Taylor paper archives, I came across this map, and we can't see it particularly well on, uh, in the light, but this is the, the area between the Commonwealth and the Canada Glacier, and this is the, a contemporary map of the, the same area, and you can see from the contemporary map that there should be a lake between these two glaciers. There was a, we now know that Lake Frixel, a fairly large, significant lake, is, uh, is between the, the glaciers where Taylor said there wasn't. So knowing that uh, Lake Bonnie had, had risen fairly dramatically, I got quite excited and thought maybe this is an entirely new lake that has uh, come into being over the last 100 years. Uh, and we ran some calculations and uh, worked out to see if this was, this was possible. And it turns out that uh, even this, this was a mistake, to, to cut a long story short. And uh, Taylor had just uh, rushed the publication of the, of the map. And this is a photograph on the, on the left from, um, from Debenham. And you can see just about in the, in the background behind the, uh, the glacier that there is a, a lake there. Although you can also see from the repeat photograph that it has, uh, it has risen and, and expanded fairly significantly over the 100 years. So it's not a new lake, but it has, uh, it has grown, it has deepened. And this is a sketch map that I found at the Scott Polar Research Institute a couple of summers ago looking at it from the other direction. And what, what is interesting here is that you can clearly see from Taylor's sketch that the lake is separate from the, the glacier. And today, Lake, um, lake Frixel is touching Canada Glacier, which does have fairly significant implications for the uh, limnology of, of Lake, lake Frixel. So this is a change that, uh, that we know about uh, through history. But I think that partly the, the relationship between Debenham and Taylor helps to account for the fact that they weren't correcting each other's work and that you could uh, have a, a major error in the, in the calculations. In terms of the meteorology, as, as meteorologists will know, it takes about 30 years for weather data to become climate. And so all we have is, is seven days of uh, weather data in the, in the dry valleys. But we can make some guesses about changing weather based on the, the lake level rise, that uh, lakes are, are, are rising because there is more meltwater in the, in the summers. And so we can look at uh, lake level change and, uh, and ask, have some idea about potentially temperature change over that time. But it's not that simple. And uh, as the scientists on the LTR have uh, explained to me, this is a a graph of uh, stream flow recorded uh, annually, and uh, the, the spike in the middle, the 2001-2002, was a historic flood year. It, it's referred to simply as the, the flood year by, by the scientists. And all of a sudden, there was a lot more uh, stream flow, and um, the, the temperature alone on the, on the graph doesn't explain the, the rising, the rising uh, stream flow uh, patterns. And so people are asking, or scientists are asking questions about what might be causing increased stream flow if we don't simply have an increase in, in annual temperature. And this is where I think we can get a few insights from, uh, from Taylor's, Taylor's calculations. Um, this is the, the weather records that, uh, that he kept. And they're, they're interesting and, and, and fun to read. The, my favorite are the, the, the discussions of the, the wind uh, speed, bitter wind, beastly cold, very windy, very unpleasant day, etc. It was so warm the, in the dry valleys, these, these recordings of 40 degrees Fahrenheit, 36 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, that they, they actually believed that the thermometer had broken. And uh, they, didn't, they didn't believe that it could be get up to this, uh, these, these balmy temperatures. In the, uh, in the middle of, of, of summer. But uh, 
what I think uh, has, has, has happened, going back to, to this, is that it's entirely possible that Taylor was, was living or was experiencing the dry valleys at a similar, at a, at a point in time that might not have been entirely dissimilar from the, the, the flood year, this, this high activity, that the, the weather was relatively warm when he went through, the streams were flowing, he was reporting fairly large moats on the, on the lakes, and so on. We know that the, uh, the lake levels had gone up fairly dramatically between Scott and uh, Taylor. So it's not um, beyond the realm of possibility that this was a, a similarly sort of connected ecosystem that uh, the Taylor was experiencing. In terms of the glaciers, repeat photographs suggest that there hasn't really been much change in terms of glacial retreat or glacially advance over the, uh, the hundred years since, uh, since Taylor. And this is consistent with what we know about the, the cold-bottomed uh, polar glaciers, but uh, we're getting increased melt and increased uh, lake levels, but not necessarily a whole bunch of uh, movement from the, from the glaciers. Repeat photographs from the, the Seuss Glacier. Potentially, uh, something interesting here is the amount of sediment that, uh, that we're seeing on the, on the glaciers. One explanation for the increased melt during the 2001-2002 uh, flood year was that you had increased sediment blown onto glaciers, and then when the sun came out, this helped to, uh, to melt the, the, the ice. Repeat photographs suggest that even back in, in 1911, there was a lot of, of, of sediment on the, on the glaciers. Streams, as I've, as I've mentioned, uh, we have descriptions of the streams one of the interesting things is that Taylor was, the, the, the streams were basically all flowing in the first week of February in, uh, in 1911, which isn't always the case, that quite often that they'll, they'll stop flowing before the, end of, before the end of January. Some of these uh, descriptions are difficult to know exactly where they, where they are, and one of the things that I'm hoping to do is to take the descriptions and try and identify exactly where Taylor was in the, in the valleys and see if there's any any ways of identifying change based on, on his descriptions. But things like, uh, this is again Lake Frixel and he's managed to put the lake on, uh, on this one. But the, the streams are consistent with what we know roughly uh, the, the locations today. Soils, uh, finally, uh, the soils, as I said, there was no biologist on the expedition. And uh, one of the interesting things we did last uh, season was go to uh, Cape Royds and, and re-look at samples of, of lake water that had been taken on the Shackleton expedition. And it would be wonderful to be able to do this in the, in the dry valleys, but as there was no biologist, nobody had any interest in taking samples of the lakes or the, or the soils. So in some ways you could say, well, we don't know what has changed with, uh, with the soils in the, in the dry valleys, but this lake, this, uh, the, this sketch map from, from Debenham, alongside the contemporary uh, satellite photo, does suggest that for the soils at the bottom of the lake, there has been a radical change as they've been inundated by, um, by the, the lake water over the last 100 years. And uh, so this has, been, this has changed, and the areas around those soils have, have wettened, and uh, the, the biological life in them undoubtedly has changed as well. Another thing I'm hoping to do as we move forward with this is to use some of the historical photos to identify uh, persistent snow patches. So you can see from this, uh, probably my favorite uh, Taylor photo taken from, from New Harbor, looking back uh, at the Commonwealth Glacier and uh, a contemporary photograph of the same, the same view. We see that in lots of places, uh, the, the snow is, is consistently um, in the same place. And just uh, going back quickly to the, the Seuss Glacier picture, <coughs> the snow patches are almost identical 100 years later. And this gives us a, a, a sense of a, sort of a hypothesis to test, are the soils around these snow patches different from, from other ones, knowing that they have uh, had consistent supplies of water, not just perennially, but over a 100 year, or likely over a 100 year period. So again, the history is, is raising questions that can help us answer uh, the contemporary scientific questions. So in conclusion, um, I think the, the first thing to, to say is that there, there are clear limitations with the, the historical data, that we, we are looking at uh, sources that are very different from the, the very carefully 
detailed and, and accurate measurements that uh, really have been taken in the area since the International Geophysical Year. And even the idea of, of calling this data rather than sort of historical records is, is problematic in, in some ways. But I would also say that this, is, this gives us a source that is, is a very valuable source to, to use, that this isn't a, a blank space in our understanding. We have some information. And so it's, it's, it's useful to, to look at the, the history and ask how it plays into, the, into these questions. As I suggested earlier, I, would, I think that there is some evidence to suggest that uh, the Taylor was in the valleys at a time when stream flow was high, when lake levels were rising, when the temperatures were relatively warm, and that 100 years ago isn't altogether different from what we're seeing at the moment, which suggests that the contemporary experience is not entirely novel. It could be a cyclical response. And so these are, these are more questions rather than, than answers, but I think important ones. And then finally, I would suggest that thinking about how we integrate history into science in, a, in, a, in the Antarctic context also gives us a model that we can potentially take and use in other more complicated, uh, more complex parts of the world. And the, the repeat photographs are, are an obvious one that have been used in many, many cases. But there are other ways of doing this as well, and the sketches and the descriptions are also, are also valuable. So I think that uh, these, are, these are transferable insights that we gain in Antarctica and we can use, use elsewhere. And so thank you to everyone here and to um, the LTR and the SF uh, for, for giving me this opportunity. And as I said at the beginning, very much I'm open to, uh, to ideas and suggestions and, and different ways of, of using this. So please ask a question or, or come up and, and let me know afterwards. Thank you very much.